Hi, this is Isabella from the Open Gov Hub. Thanks for tuning in for our roundtable discussion titled Window of Opportunity, Global Lessons for Governance Reform in the U.S. In a moment, you'll meet our speakers and co-moderators. Our speakers are reformers from three countries, Guatemala, South Africa, and Slovakia. Now that there is a window of opportunity for governance reform with the Biden-Harris administration, how should we seize it? Dave and Floor, co-moderators and co-authors of a recent OSF report on a similar topic, will guide the conversation. Thank you everyone for joining. As people are logging on, I'll just do um, a warm welcome to everyone in the room. I'm Isabella from the Open Gov Hub. We are a dynamic meeting place in Washington, D.C. that brings together about 50 organizations that work on transparency, accountability, and civic participation. And we have done a series of events and research in the past on defending democracy and currently outside in initiative through global integrity, which essentially brings lessons from other countries for the US governance. Um, and this event is very much aligned with this theme. And I am very pleased to welcome Dave Algoso, who will introduce all of our speakers and tell you more about why we're together today. Thank you. Take it away, Dave. Great. Thank you, Isabella. Um, welcome, everyone. Wonderful to see some familiar faces and, and, and lots of unfamiliar ones as well. Um, so this is our window of opportunity, Global Lessons for Governance Reform in the United States event. Um, my name is Dave Algoso. Again, I'll be your co-moderator along with my colleague, um, Florencia Guerzovic. You'll hear from her and from our great panelists um, in a minute. But first, I want to frame this conversation a bit kind of in terms of what we mean by a window of opportunity um, and why I'm particularly excited to moderate this event. Um, while I do so, please take a minute to open up the chat and just sort of say hello. Um, let us know who, where you're coming from, both geographically as well as if you represent an organization, just to say hi and we can kind of get a sense of who else um, is with us. So to frame this idea of windows, um, very early in my career, when I was maybe 23 years old, I worked on a campaign um, that was trying to take advantage of a window of opportunity um, in Ohio. Um, the governor of Ohio had actually just been charged with accepting illegal gifts from lobbyists. This was uh, 2005, Governor Bob Taft, if we have any Ohioans around. Um, I worked for a group called Common Cause, um, which along with a broader coalition was trying to put forward a big package of reforms um, following this scandal breaking. Um, you know, it was a ballot referendums around everything from ethics rules and campaign finance reform to ending gerrymandering. It was sort of a big package. We spent months campaigning, building coalition, outreach to voters, all of this, and we lost by a huge amount. Um, and we, there were a lot of reasons why we lost. But the big lesson that I took from that, from that campaign was that if it had not been for that window, um, if it had not been for that scandal sort of changing the public dialogue around corruption in Ohio, um, we would not even have had a chance to wage that campaign, let alone had a chance to, to lose through it. Um, so fast forwarding many, many years, um, I think we see another window at the national level with the end of the Trump administration, um, with the beginning of the Biden administration. Um, it's a very different world though from 2005. Um, for starters, in that Ohio campaign, um, we ran most of our ads on radio. Twitter and Facebook did not exist. Um, and that meant a very dramatically different sort of information landscape, not to mention sort of lower levels of political polarization kind of across the nation. So rather than, if we want to understand how to seize this window, this, this moment that we have with the Biden administration coming in, um, rather than kind of looking back to windows in the distant past in the US, um, we think it's a lot more valuable to look at more recent windows from other countries. Um, a few years ago, that might have um, gone against some of my kind of compatriots, my fellow American sense of like American exceptionalism. You know, there's, this, there's always been this sense that we're like a beacon of democracy in the world, things work differently here, yada, yada. Um, I, and I've, I've, I've been guilty of that myself. Um, but if I think it's fair to say that even if Trump's election in 2016 had not kind of shaken that sense for you, um, you know, even if you managed to hold on to that for the last four years of like corruption and cronyism under Trump, um, the, I, for me, the mob that stormed the Capitol, the US Capitol just six weeks ago, um, kind of would have permanently extinguished that, that belief in exceptionalism of the US. Um, so if we're able to let go of that exceptionalism though, I think that we can learn from and learn with like-minded reformers from other countries who have faced and, and continue to face some similar challenges. And that, and that really brings us to our opportunity 
um, that we have today. So my colleague Flora and I, along with a uh, third colleague, um, Sol Gatoni, who's not on the call uh, right now, she's on uh, paternal, uh, sorry, maternal leave. Um, we've been lucky enough to study windows of opportunity, looking at a few countries um, to try and understand how reformers have tried to take advantage of these different opportunities and what challenges and needs they faced as they did so. Um, in that research, um, we were interested in understanding how global organizations like NGOs or donor organizations or, or you know, it was funded by the Open Society Foundation. So um, organizations like theirs might be able to better support reformers in those windows. Um, I mentioned that research because it forms a backdrop to this event. Um, and we can share some links in the chat for folks who are interested, but this event is not about sharing the findings from that research. Um, today's event is instead is a chance to hear from a few of those reformers who we met over the course of that research. So each of these panelists are going, uh, you know, they were part of trying to seize uh, a window in their country, um, a window that, that opened and then either closed or at least kind of tapered somewhat, and it can be disputed exactly how, um, in the past five years. Our agenda is pretty straightforward. So um, Flora and I are going to introduce each of the panelists briefly. We're also going to pitch some questions to them about their experiences and their work during those windows in their countries. Then we will um, start to steer the conversation towards lessons that their experiences might have for other countries, especially for the United States. Um, and in the second half of the session, we'll start to open it up much more to questions and discussion from the full group. Um, of course, as people are introducing themselves in the chat, feel free to also put questions in there or responses to what the panelists are saying. So we can start that even before we've opened up the conversation. Um, with that framing in, in place, I'm gonna turn it over to Floor to start our conversation. Um, we will ask our panelists to keep their responses relatively brief to about two to three minutes, just so we can keep the conversation going. Um, I'll keep track of time on my side. I might give you a, a kind of wrap things up hand motion um, just to kind of keep us moving, but we also want to make sure we have space for the discussion. So with that, Floor, please take over. Hi, thanks, Dave. So great to see everyone. Uh joining for this conversation. Um, I wanted to start with a little bit of a background uh, about the stories that we're gonna hear about today. So almost three years to the day today, um, investigative journalists Jan Kuciak and Martina Kushnirova, his fiance, were murdered in Slovakia. At that time, people started pouring in the streets uh, of, around the country demanding for a decent Slovakia. Um, the murders were, I would say successfully framed as a political issue, a product of state capture and systemic corruption. And corruption became a key issue in subnational European presidential and parliamentary elections throughout that period. Our, our first guest today, Radovan Pala, is a corporate lawyer, a partner at Taylor Westing, Slovakia, and contributed to a very innovative beneficial ownership reform in the country, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with uh, at the Hub before this murders and this happened. He is now advisor to Slovakia's president, Zuzana Chaputova. So Radovan, I'm sure I didn't mispronounce the name. Um, uh, if you can think back to the moment when Jan and Martina were murdered and people were started going to the streets and the prime minister very quickly resigned, what does that, that feel like? for you? Did you recognize it as a window? What did you think would be done then? Oh, thank you, thank you, Florencia. Uh, yes, I can remember quite uh, vividly and uh, precisely, and it's also on a personal, on two, on, in two ways on personal level. Uh, one thing is that uh, just a day before, before the murder was uh, revealed, before uh, on the day after uh, the, on the day uh, the bodies were found, a uh, day before that, uh, our third child was born. So uh, I remember that uh, that week very, very vividly. And uh, it is also because I represented clients against uh, one of those men who are very much suspected uh, of orchestrating the murder. So uh, I felt also on a personal level, I felt I would not say uh, fear, but I was afraid uh, pretty much. And uh, when you ask about the window of opportunity, at the first, at first, it didn't seem like a window of opportunity because it seemed uh, that the, yes, this is something that that is bound to happen in a country where in Slovakia we have democracy. There is no 
there is no meddling in elections. The elections are free, but uh, the country was very corrupt. And uh, at the beginning, it was not sure. It was not quite so obvious if something will happen. But in about two or three days after the murders, uh, Facebook groups started to grow, and uh, we suddenly saw that people went to streets, and it was not like just hundreds of people or even thousands of people it was tens of thousands of people and which is very nice in slovakia we have uh this this these gatherings of people were very calm and peaceful but very strong so i felt like after about a week i felt yes this might be something that will rock uh will rock the the system uh because the system was of course, uh, denying any accountability and responsibility, but uh, also because the political system reacted very clumsily and in a very, uh, I would say, in a way that they 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 were arrogant. Uh, the people, you know, the people started to react uh, more uh, like more convinced. They were more and more convinced that something has to be done. And I think after several days. There started to be people coming out from the system, from within the system, like policemen, investigators, prosecutors. We started to speak out and say, "Yes, this is not going well. This is this, there is a huge problem. We have a huge problem." And uh, yes, I, I can say that uh, several days after the murders, uh, we already knew that something big is going on, and this, that this could be the time when uh, the system will be rocked uh, and and will be will be changed in some way. Great, thank you, Radovan. I wanna bring in another one of our panelists. So um, many of you, many Americans and folks around the world have heard the term state capture um, in reference to South Africa and other places, but I feel like that's where, uh, you know, investigations and leaks over the course of, especially around 2017, um, really revealed the way that President Jacob Zuma and his allies, especially a, a powerful family called the Guptas, um, had really squeezed money out of the South African state, and not just in petty corruption, but in large structural uh, changes that um, that that are kind of, I think, very well framed under the term state capture. Um, by way of introduction, Zen uh, Mathe is a uh, researcher with Open Secret South Africa, which is a civil society group that has investigated economic crimes, which another is, is another term that I hear used in South Africa that I feel like we could use in the United States. Um, uh, they invent, from, from the apartheid era on forward. Um, so Zen, if you kind of similar question, if you can think back to that moment when the window opened, in particular kind of when Cyril Ramaphosa succeeded uh, Zuma as president in, in early 2018, um, what did that feel like? Did you recognize that as an opportunity? Um, what did you think at that moment could, could be achieved? Yeah, thank you, Dave, and, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I think, I, when the new administration came in um, with under the Cyril Ramaphosa presidency, there was the sense, you know, and I can't speak for all of civil society in South Africa, but there was definitely um, in large pockets of civil society, the sense of a victory in many ways, the sense of a new hope. There was um, civil society had been mounting what had been, I think, from about 2010 through various pockets and different student movements, Fees Must Fall, um, you know, through um, organizations such as Right to Know with access to information. Um, uh, there had been this radical incrementalism almost um, through this uh, sustained fight and pushback by civil society in the country in various pockets around different issues, which when you look at it all were kind of linked um, to, you know, what um, culminated in a moment that can be recognized as a window in hindsight and in analysis, but really was just civil society on the ground doing the grunt work every day, day in and day out. And so what seemed, you know, with this new administration was the sense of civil society in a moment, I think since post-democracy for the first time, um, there was a moment of collective 
recognition of um, what happens when civil society, what can happen um, in the sense of a new hope when civil society um, collaborates over a sustained period of time. And so, and the new administration then also came in and presented itself as a new dawn. Um, um, and so they, they, they named, um, you know, this new era as a new dawn. And so as civil society, we also seems to breathe. Um, for the first time in what seemed to be a long time. And so the feeling was, was that of, of, of relief um, and, um, and hope, um, but also um, a sense of skepticism. Um, in, 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 there were undercurrents of skepticism. Um, you know, civil society isn't a single voice and we don't all agree. And I think, you know, there was, so to answer the question about how did it feel, there was this balance, there was, you know, not an equal balance, but there were these two feelings of this breath of fresh air and, and a sense of a new hope and what the new administration had, taught, had termed a new dawn. Um, and on the other hand, a recognition that yes, this was in many ways, a, a break of fresh air and a new opportunity, but maybe a false sense of a new dawn. And so, yeah, that, that I think that summarized, I think in many ways, not, yeah, a sense of what the feeling was in that moment. That's great. Before turning to Gabriel, just let me say how excited I am that we have people not only talking about different countries, but from different perspectives in the system. And that's that's also what Gabriel brings. Uh, in Guatemala, uh, the International Commission, CICIG, announced corruption investigations to then president, Otto Perez Molina and others, leading to an outbreak of demonstrations, the president resignation and the election of president Jimmy Morales. Gabriel Ware, who joins us, co-founded and coordinated Justicia Siaja, a social movement that was at the center of the street protests, and then went on to do something that many of you have, have also been thinking about, which is work through formal civil society organization, Instituto 25A, to make that, that and other social movements stronger. Uh, so at in the trenches, in social media and the streets. What did it feel like, Gabriel? What did you think? Was it a window? Did it look like that? Thank you. Thank you for, for having me today. I'm really happy to be here um, sharing this, this experience we had here in Guatemala. Um, well, well, I think one of one of the one of the first things I want to say is that um, the feeling was one of endless possibilities at one point. You know you, that anything could happen, and and uh, and that had a lot of different groups and sectors agreed on something very precise and concrete. And and it, it feels as if you're driving, and suddenly all the lights turn green, even though even the ones you never thought could turn green <laughs> suddenly turn green. So so it's like just go, you know. Um, but but we didn't have any experience, so so we really um, we were really focused on keeping the protests going. Uh, however, we started asking ourselves what happens after the president resigns. If he does sign, what happens afterwards? And, and that doesn't solve the issues of our country has, and it doesn't prevent others like him, or worst, in the case of Jimmy Morales, to become president, and it happened, or lawmaker, judge. Uh, so that's, that's when we started looking around our, around us to, to map out who is proposing changes, how likely are these changes um, going to happen and how they align with, with being on the streets in every protest. And that was very important just to, just to learn what people were thinking about, what people were uh, just proposing. And, and in our case, it was electoral system reform, it was justice, it was purchase and hiring legislation, um, it was civil services. So those were the, the four main issues because they were the, the they, they were, and they are, I think, the, the main sources of corruption in our country. So, um, and, and, and I think something important as well is that just a few experienced people and organizations were actually talking about a window of opportunity as such. You know, they were saying, we have this window of opportunity, we need to do something. But in our very poor experience back then, it felt, it felt as if they were exaggerating because change felt inevitable. 
you know, we really felt that change was inevitable. So, so we, we thought they were exaggerating. So, so we didn't have the, the same sense of urgency, just, you know, just to, to move forward. And now we know that that's what a window of opportunity feels like. Yeah, thank you all for that. I, I love hearing sort of that tension between the hope and foreboding or, or the risks or sort of the, 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 the tension that we all feel. And I, I think a lot of uh, Americans certainly feel that at this moment as well. We're going to turn to our second question and we'll go through in the same order, starting with Radovan. So the second question that we have for all of you is, um, you know, what obstacles, so as the window evolved, what obstacles or challenges did you face, you know, where that maybe that foreboding or those risks came real, uh, the ones that you saw as well as maybe the ones that you didn't expect? Well, I have to say that uh, the experience of Slovakia is a bit uh, different to, to these uh, experiences uh, where really there was no freedom, no democracy before. Uh, this was much more about uh, people who felt free but uh, lived in a regime that was very corrupt. Uh, and I have to say, uh, I lived through a real revolution in 1989. You remember the Berlin Wall, but in Slovakia that happened as well. It, approximately 20 days after the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, and I remember that was like a little bit like what Gabriel says uh, in Slovakia. It was like a total change, suddenly all the green lights on. This was not the same uh, what we saw three years ago in Slovakia. Uh, the problem was that the government stayed in power even though uh, they were under tremendous pressure to change things. And uh, I would say uh, one of the one of the greatest obstacles was how to how to deal with the camouflage that the government uh, put in place because they changed the prime minister, uh, Mr. Fico, who was the the face of the previous regime of the of the of all those corrupt practices. They changed him for a younger, much more sim like sympathetic like guy who was really good looking, and so it was like the old guard under the uh, disguise of uh, new face and uh, it was also so this was one of the difficulties and and uh, also of course uh, the world is very much different to what it was in 1989 for example in Slovakia we had the social media impact on one hand it was a very very beneficial to organize people to go to the streets to start the protest to put the pressure on but it was also uh, of course, the, the, I always say the future ain't what it used to be. It is so, it is so uh, um, diverse. So there were so many people who started immediately saying these people are paid by American Soros guys. Even the, even the prime minister, the, Mr. Fico, he said, uh, of course, uh, Mr. George Soros uh, paid for this. And there were, of course, many people on the social media who started to take this, uh, let's say, uh, let's say, um, even like uh, this is once again that they want to uh, get us away from Russia or wh whatever you can imagine whatever you want so it was important to be focused on the narrative that what is important what is what is really important to achieve uh, and that that was one of the things is of course the amount of corruption that was really depleting uh, Slovakia Slovakia is a member of the EU we should and we have a much higher uh, level of uh, standard of living that we had 20 years ago, but still we are much more, much worse off than we could be. And so it was, it was difficult to concentrate. And it is also uh, true that, uh, that, the, that the, one of the obstacles, and I will come to that later perhaps, is that, you know, you have to find competent people, you have to find people with integrity because, and this is a big lesson, I think also for any country which goes through revolution or change of regime, that somebody who is a dissident doesn't have to be a person of integrity. Uh, it, it can be still someone who, uh, someone who fails when it comes to, uh, comes to real dilemma. Great. Thank you, Radovan. I'm going to turn the same question to Zen, though, about obstacles and challenges you faced as the window evolved. Um, I don't think there's one. Um, there's consensus in civil society about one um, particular challenge, but I think just from us and uh, the general sense was uh, a sense, the, the, the narrative of the new administration of a new dawn and a new hope had been 
um, pushed to the point where, you know, in terms of the tensions between civil society about the, you know, the two senses, what seems to um, prevail was a civil soci society feeling of, yes, this is a new dawn, and almost as civil society, we, you know, can now breathe, when what ended up being a feeling at, you know, what, at the window of opportunity proved just prior to that, just um, subsequent to that, to actually be a challenge and an obstacle because um, sustained civil society engagement um, is pivotal. And so there seemed to be the sense that now in this new dawn, this narrative, what the feeling uh, what, that, that happened at the window of opportunity, um, civil society, I think, then handed the baton over almost to this new administration and felt that the sustained civil society engagement, which, you know, culminated and what, you know, ended up being this administrational change, uh, civil society, what one was this hope, this breath, we can breathe, handing over the baton, um, as it were, to the state and the new administration to take reform forward. So almost the civil society um, being relieved that we can now continue to do the other work that we're busy with in our various areas and pockets and almost demobilize as a collective and that the new state and the new administration will um, self-regulate and, um, and fix. Um, and, and, and I mean, in the first hundred days, and I mean, we don't want to limit what happens in the first hundred days, but there were big promises and, um, you know, and, and a lot of changes uh, taking place, what then proved to be surface level changes, you know, um, but but yeah, so that was kind of, so strangely enough, uh, one of the things, the challenge that we dealt with, and I think how we then um, dealt with that, um, how I guess the question also leads to how did you deal with that with with that challenge and I think that was to reorganize a civil society and and to really say you know we've been here before um our history from you know transitioning from apartheid to post-apartheid um let's take those lessons how do we re how do we we know that the state doesn't self-regulate and um it's 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 not actually a moment where we can hand over the baton if anything um continued collaboration um, organize, organize, organize in this moment could prove to be more pivotal, uh, not more pivotal, but as pivotal as it was to um, ensuring that the administration did in fact change. And so I think continued collaboration is the answer to um, how we then kind of try to, to deal with that, um, what would have ended up being a really unfortunate moment to lose momentum um, and to hand over to the state to self-regulate um, under the guise of a new dawn. Yeah. Thank you, Zen. Zen's already even moved us into sort of how to respond to those challenges, which for anyone think I'm being, thinking I'm being too pessimistic about asking about challenges and obstacles, we're going to come to some of the, the lessons for how to respond as well. Um, so it would be a great segue, except I want to turn to Gabriel first. Uh, so to think about those obstacles and challenges that, that you faced as the window evolved in Guatemala. Yes, I think one of the, one of the, one of the things that was really interesting here in Guatemala is that I think people in power were caught off guard with what with what happened here, and and that's what opened the window. Um, that was one of the reasons that opened the window. So so th they had no time in uh, in sort of organizing to stop whatever uh, demands and changes people were uh, were were asking for on the streets and also in other in other in other uh, spaces and other in, in, in other instances. So I think. But, one of the one of the challenges that we faced was 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 being quick enough to to take advantage of the window, and I think we, as I mentioned before, I think we weren't quick enough because we we didn't recognize the nature, we didn't know what the nature of, of a window of opportunity was back then, and 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 we weren't ready with the specifics, we weren't ready with what, we we knew what we wanted and we knew what we didn't want. But when, when you got down to the specifics, we really didn't know or we didn't really agree on everything. So I, I think that, that that's, that's, that's very important to, to have something ready and agreed upon that, that you can say, okay, this is what we want. And one of, one of the other challenges that we face is that we realized we didn't have many allies within Congress and government. So, so you, 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 you could demand a lot of things, but, but at the end, people who voted for these reforms are, are lawmakers. And back then, the, the, most of them were not allies. So, so they tried their best to stop and block whatever 
we were asking for. And, and they, they, they weren't able to block everything, but they did change it a lot. So at the end of the day, what we, what we demanded wasn't really what was approved at the end. It had a lot of changes in form and, 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 also, and, also, and also in, 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 in most of the key issues. So we could say that there was, that the reform happened. So they, they said, we, 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 we gave you what you wanted, but when you looked at the specifics, it didn't, it didn't match, it, it, it wasn't what we, what we asked for. And, um, and I think one of the other things that, that, we, that we faced as, as, a very, as a huge challenge, I think, looking back now is that not being, it, it was not being aware of the public discourse and the hidden discourse. Because most of the political actors, they were saying one thing to, to media outlets, they were saying uh, those, those same things in the, in the meetings, in the big meetings we had, and, and in, 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 uh, but then they, they were doing something else. They were negotiating with, 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 with other uh, uh, groups of power, other actors in, in, in a very different way. So, so not being aware of that, that, that caught us off guard, I think. And, and that also made us not foresee the backlash that was coming. And, 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 and it came and it came really, really, really hard. So, so that, I think that there was something very, very important. And, and, and also what you mentioned, I think before is, is about the thing with burnout as well, not burnout with the people who are organizing and, are, and are, are doing all this, but also people in general just get fed up and drop their support when the window generates polarization or, or, or the change feels too abstract. So you don't know if you wanna support that as well. So I think, um, as Sen was, was, was talking, narrative, I think, is key uh, in, in, through the windows of opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Um, you. You hit on a lot of points that we heard throughout this research um, about, the, the, in one in particular, sort of the risks of, of backlash. Um, you know, the, the windows are a moment of risk, which means potentially high return, but also others are trying to take advantage of that window for their purposes. So I want to turn towards kind of what was, what was achieved uh, in some sense during the window, um, both positively and especially positively. And if so, it, you know, how did you overcome those challenges to achieve that? But then also, was there backsliding? Were there places where things went a, a, a different, opposite the direction that you would, would have wanted or hoped that they did? So we're going to go in the same order. Uh, I'll turn to Radovan first. Yes, uh, of course, it's a mixed bag. Uh, I can't say, you never can say it's only a clear, uh, clear progress. But uh, what I think in Slovakia was clearly achieved was that some uh, some key positions in the state were uh, are now held by people with integrity with uh, with a real uh, with real um, vision. Uh, one of the the best example is of course our president Mrs. Chaputova, who is uh, really I think uh, a very stabilizing uh, um, stabilizing person for the whole political scene, which gets. And I think this is a global phenomenon uh, is getting radicalized and uh, just just, uh, you know, atomized. So this is important. And I think this is one one thing that has been achieved in Slovakia that uh, that the elections which were last year uh, brought uh, uh, into power people who have clear anti-corruption agenda. Uh, so there are, for example, the new general attorney which is a very, it's a chief prosecutor basically, uh, who can uh, prosecute uh, corruption, is, uh, is uh, someone who has good credit, uh, who, who uh, can do something. So this is, for me, this is one thing which is important to get those people. And this is what I felt when the window of opportunity came, that those people on the streets, we need to translate that power into, the, into those people holding the positions because doesn't make any good if people are on the streets, but nothing happens on the top. The problem is, and this is a long-term problem for everybody, I think, for the U.S. as well, is what they say, you know, this is a business talk, but they say culture is strategy for breakfast. And if you have a corrupt society, which lived in corruption for, corruption for many years, uh, it is not easy to change. It is very difficult to change because people behave that way and they don't see an upside to sticking to abstract rules. They see direct benefits of, uh, of not following the rules of, 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 and, and the conflicts of interest are immense. Perception of conflicts of interest is a problem. Even those reform, many reformers, once they get into power, they suddenly lose the sense of what is allowed and what is not allowed. So this is the risk. 
Uh, and if they lose that sense, the people will lose hope because they will think, okay, these were the guys who promised uh, anti-corruption or change and they didn't do it. And one more thing, many people from civil society in, this, in these days of change, they get into the power. So they change basically the dress. They stop to be civil society uh, people, but they go and hold positions. Of course, then it is difficult for the civil society at the start at least uh, uh, to take a position. So this is also one thing that's, uh, that's uh, important, but I totally agree that it, it doesn't stop. You have to look at uh, the power and uh, how, 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 how the power is executed. Thanks, Radovan. Going to turn the same question to Zen around what was achieved or where there was potentially some backsliding over the course of the window. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think, I'm not sure if I can frame it as an achievement, but it, it certainly felt like one, I think. Um, was that the acknowledgement of what had been um, prior to this window of opportunity um, allegations and uh, trying to be framed as speculations of what was happening. Um, and and, and um, it, it, there was a formalization and a public acknowledgement um, as a country of what was actually going on, of state capture, of corruption, accepting that this is something that um, was taking place. Um, whereas before, it was civil society trying to push, trying to expose in all their different pockets through research and through various mobilizations, um, what then became validated and, and, and taken to be, actually, this is a fact, this is what happened. And, uh, um, so in a sense, it felt, yeah, like I said, an achievement and acknowledgement of actually what um, was happening. And I think what continued to be achieved through the reorganization of civil society in the window um, was that um, in South Africa, one of the ways in which the new administration um, continued in this, which formed the window, was to establish uh, the a State Capture Commission of Inquiry, um, um, which is chaired by the Deputy Chief Justice of um, a previous deputy chief justice of the constitutional court, um, and and he's chaired that process, and so that's one of the things the, the continued pressures of civil society um, forced um, an actionable step to deal with something that then what had to be acknowledged, um, um, you, and so that was one of the big things that was was achieved through this window and and through the civil society collaboration, but through that as well, what has continued to be an achievement was the formation of a, a group called the Civil Society Working Group on State Capture, um, which is made up of over 25 civil society organizations, um, which came together in 2018 and con has continued to mobilize even till now around the Zonda Commission. And um, what has this coalition of, of all these different organizations um, it feels like another huge achievement that um, uh, happened uh, that was in this that was afforded in this window of opportunity and the this brought it, it's a broad church of organizations that don't usually come together on issues and the challenge of staying together around um, as a coalition around this particular issue um, has presented of course many challenges because we don't agree ideologically we don't agree um, on a number of things but um, acknowledging through that we've achieved continued collaboration by acknowledging and uh, by figuring out ways through this process um, of um, understanding each other's ideological differences and being able to, to work through those, not necessarily by always agreeing on everything, but for the, the purpose of continued civil society collaboration. Um, and so I think that's something that's um, been a huge achievement um, uh, um, and that the window of opportunity uh, afforded to us. Great, thank you, Zen. I love that point about kind of the evolution of civil society within that moment, not only leading up to, but as the window is open. Let's turn to, to Gabriel for the last, uh, on this question of kind of what was achieved and also whether there were places of backsliding. Yes, I, I think in Guatemala, there, there was a mix of progress um, from the four issues I mentioned before, only two passed as reform and not in the way that we expected uh, to happen. But, but still, it, it, it made it possible. And, 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 it, and it also created this narrative that if we collaborate and we build these coalitions, as Zen was saying, then we can actually 
make those changes happen. So I think that was important. And, and the lesson there is that it, it's not just about the reform itself, which is very important, but also the process to get there is also a win. And, and it has proven to be key in other windows, much smaller windows here in Guatemala that have opened since. And, and, and is this collaboration um, across stakeholders, international community, independent media that has made the difference in, in, in key moments here in Guatemala. Um, and, and, and this is very important. For, it, it might not seem like it's a huge deal, but for, for us in Guatemala, it is because we have, uh, because trust is a huge problem here in Guatemala after the, the civil war that we endured for om almost 40 years, um, trust was just destroyed. And it's been really, really hard to rebuild trust um, within civil society even. And, and, and I think that's, that, that's the windows of opportunity that we've had so far. I think in the past five to eight years have helped to rebuild some of that trust. We haven't been able to, 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 to do it uh, more broadly, but we have. And, and, and I think one of, the, one of the, the, the things that we're seeing now is how all these changes that, that, that were made, not, not just as, 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 a, as, um, as legislation, but also within ins the public institutions, the, 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 the government of Jimmy Morales and the current government of, of, of Alejandro Yamate, they have been um, just uh, rolling back whatever changes were, were, were achieved. And, and I think that's, that's the other lesson I think that we learned is that aiming for points of no return, even though they might not feel that relevant or don't appeal as much as other issues is important. And we didn't know them. We, we, we didn't identify what those points of no return were to be able to make sure that the changes that are achieved uh, are, 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 are long lasting. So, so and, and, and usually those points of no return are not as appealing uh, to everyone and, and they don't have this broad support, but they are important and you can achieve that support. So, so I think that was one of the, the biggest lessons we've learned from that window of opportunity. That's great. So you already went to our last question. It's gonna be a quick one and it's asking you to pass it on, pass the advice on. Standing today with hindsight, what do you wish someone had told you at that moment when the window opened? What advice would you have liked to receive at that point? So keep it short because there's some, some very cool questions on the chat. Uh, maybe start with Radovan and we, we close with Gabriel. I, I can't honestly say what I, I would have wished to know at that time, but what I really know, and I think as an advisor, I, I, I would even tell to anyone, uh, is that really keep an eye on the conflicts of interest, because the corruption is only a form of a, of a conflict of interest. They have other forms, nepotism, at various favors, whatever, and it is eroding the trust, just as Gabriel said, the trust is eroded not only by civil war, it is eroded by corrupt system, and it is not only trust towards authorities, but also between people. Uh, and uh, so the, the most important thing for, for me is really to tr build the trust uh, within the system, because even in, I think in the US, the, the Trump was brought to power because the conflicts of interest uh, the, the society perceived the conflicts of interest of the establishment before. So, for example, for me, and this is a personal thing, and you already mentioned it, uh, Florencia, corporate transparency for me is a first step, and I really perceive this as a global threat to the dark money and the threat of uh, untransparent corporate structures. That's the first step to look at the conflicts of interest, because this is where many conflicts of interest play out, and where the people in power just hide them. So uh, I think this is something you need to focus on. Thanks, then. Oh, yeah, I guess it's, it's a difficult question to answer, but I, I think organize, organize, organize is the main thing. Um, as mentioned, civil society, the state is not going to self-regulate. Um, and the a robust civil society is the price of our freedom a lot of the time. And so organizing, 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 continued and sustained um, civil society collaboration um, 
is I think one of the pivotal um, lessons to learn and understanding, I think the fact that it's not um, an easy, the center, this time, it's a time of, I think we, I'm not sure who said it, of competing narratives and being aware of the, the different competing narratives and um, that sometimes the more things change, the more they stay the same, which was a hard lesson for us in, you know, as, you know, how, how do we, as, um, you know, collaborative, collaborating civil society in this window, understand the, the different A narratives that are competing, B continue to organize um, and C um, not losing momentum um, in a time where it seems that change is afoot um, because of surface level things that are happening. But what is happening for us now, especially now in, in South Africa is seeing that uh, some of the surface level changes didn't materialize into actual change. You know, we have people that were in the old administration still holding powerful positions today. We have um, narratives that are um, being pushed. Uh, you know, for example, for us, uh, finding that um, pushing the, the, the fact that the private sector was an enabler of state capture and, and corruption in this country and was not a victim of what seemed to be this political network um, to which the, 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 the private sector is um, victim. You, you know, so the, these narratives and um, identifying them and pushing against them and, and providing the counter narratives of civil society and continuing to do so on a sustained basis and staying organized, I think, is one of um, the important things and, and staying vigilant um, and yeah. Um, yes, I think um, one, one advice I would give is identify your allies for the specific reforms that you are pushing for and bear in mind that it's a coalition within the window. It doesn't need to exist afterwards. So don't be too <laughs> scared to sit down with people or groups that you usually wouldn't sit down with. Um, I think also another uh, advice is, is make sure that everyone understands why this is important, how it affects everyday life and, and why now is the time to do it. Because usually it's, oh, later we, we need to deal with it. Now is the time, if, if, the, if the time is now, we need to do it now. Be ready, be ready with the specifics, be ready with, with the agreements, uh, be ready um, uh, to aim for the points of no return and uh, be quick because the window is, it feels like, like it's a long time, but it's really, it, it, it just closes very quickly. <laughs> um, but, in, but, but in being quick, always honor the agreements because usually, uh, um, you know, if, if you need to be quick, usually that's an excuse to not honor what was agreed upon. So I think be very careful with that. <laughs> Uh, don't let them take over the narrative, as, as we already spoke. And, and, and finally, I would say prepare for the backlash in a political sense, in a legal sense, in an economic sense, and also in an emotional sense, because, because it's really hard to get back up, <laughs> to stand back up after, after, after a backlash. Thank you for all of that. Um, we are going to, it's already been an incredibly rich conversation um, and we have gone a little longer than, than we wanted for the kind of panelist portion, but there was so much amazing content here that I didn't want to cut anyone off. Um, uh, but we started to get some amazing questions in. I'm going to try to summarize a few that I think uh, that came in on the chat that seemed like they actually kind of connect together. And I'm going to put them to the full panel and see who wants to try and uh, take a swing at them. So there, there was a, a comment from Neda um, of, from the Open Gov Hub about civil society kind of relaxing too much. Um, and this was a theme that was mentioned in a couple of these, um, expecting the administration to kind of carry the reforms forward now that they're in. This is definitely, you know, in South Africa, people refer to the Cyril effect. Uh, we could talk about the Joe effect in the United States. Um, but then Veronica, I think from the Global Integrity Team, tried to about how to do this in a context of kind of deep ideological division. Um, 
when there's a huge opposition from a huge swath of voters who are just never going to get on board. Um, and you know, in a lot of the research, we talked about the role of disinformation in this, um, in these challenges. Um, and then, um, I, and then I'm going to also kind of tie in a comment or a question from Abigail, who picked up on this narrative point that that Gabriel was just coming back to, and that has, has shown up throughout this conversation about how do you use narratives to potentially prolong the window again when. Um, when disinformation means you don't really have control over the narrative. There are, there are a lot of narratives, competing narratives, completely false narratives sometimes out there that you're trying to potentially work against. How do you keep civil society motivated? How do you make sure that there, you overcome that ideological division when there is this like severe challenge of disinformation within the narrative space? I know that's a big question. So feel free to take a swing at any part of that. They just seem like they were connected in my mind and I wanted to, to bring them all out. I can, I can just, um, yeah, I, I think, I think uh, here in Guatemala, what happened a lot during the window was that we had the um, civil society pushing for a reform and government had this narrative against it, of course. But what they also did is that they started um, investing in, in net centers and social media to try to make it seem that the problem was not uh, who was in favor or against it, but the problem was the fighting itself. You know, so so a lot of the uh, of the focus and the energy went into into uh, I'm not part of any of, of of the sides. I just want my country to be better, and 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 that demobilized a lot and, and, that, and, and we lost a lot of support because people were just tired of, 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 of the supposed fighting um, within these two groups. Uh, so, so the idea of the, there, there's only two groups that are fighting for something, I think that's, that's, uh, that's dangerous because it, 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 it quickly turns into something about, it, it quickly makes it about the fight uh, or about the two, the two uh, opposing um, groups and not the issues. Um, themselves. So, so I think that that's very important. And, and also um, for us, um, because I saw the question, so a question about that there as well, is it's also the, the independent media had a huge role to play during the window. And I think uh, I, I can compare it to Honduras, where uh, at the same time they were having protests and they were also having demands, but they didn't have strong media, independent media outlets. And it made a huge difference. Uh, on, on how the issues were, were um, presented and how the narrative was built around the, 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 the facts and the issues that were happening. And, 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 and I think that that made a, a big difference. But, but also uh, something important is, is, to, is to, to take into account that narrative is, of course, not a static thing. Um, so you have to be very quick in, 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 try, in, in getting a sense of of what the the what you should be saying when you when and to whom you should be saying to so so I think I don't know if if, if, if this makes sense but but we we had a, a group of people that that we just met um, almost uh, every day just to discuss about narrative and how how things are, are are changing very rapidly and how to use things like humor for example it's very important in order to to keep the narrative. Um, uh, to keep the support <laughs> going, because because if 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 you if you used humor, it, it was more likely that people wouldn't get fed up of it very quickly, which was something that happened a lot. Zen or Radovan, anything to add on this question of the narrative component, disinformation, polarization? Go ahead, Radovan. Uh, I think just uh, just a couple of words. Uh, I think it's uh, of course it's important to stick to the values. Uh, I think that's uh, that's very important. Of course, you can't prevent the disinformation to happen. You can't prevent uh, uh, counter narratives, uh, and you can only really uh, go through it whether you are still a civil society member or you are a politician who tries to do some reforms. Uh, Still, this, this, this is a question of integrity. So, uh, for, from my point of view, if, uh, if, uh, if, if, if the ones who, who pursue the reforms uh, stick to the values they promote, there is, it is very important that they, they, they really, they really uh, have it. And of course, it's important, and this is on the side, uh, judiciary and uh, all the, all the, pro, uh, like the 
prosecution, these these uh, these branches of power, it is very important to have those uh, have those uh, you know that the, these work well because if you don't have a working judiciary, uh, you, you can do whatever you want. You will never get there. Can I can I ask a, a follow up? Sorry, Flor Zen was about to respond to that question Sorry, as well. I don't. Know, it's just a short point. Um, thanks, Dave. It's disinformation is there's so much that we can say about it. Um, I think, but just to kind of just add on to what the panelists here have said is for us keeping civil society motivated in an era of disinformation. Just to try to answer that is um, establishing our message, establishing our goal um and uh, understanding our issue that we are, are focusing around and um finding ways to sustain the narrative and to keep it alive um identifying our message um and keep repunting it and um that is a way that um we found really works and and some and not giving disinformation airplay um in in many ways even a response I mean, this doesn't account. This doesn't count for everything. But sometimes, even just responding to um, the, the disinformation gives it exactly what those who put it out want from from putting it out in the first place. And so, sometimes what we found is just not responding to disinformation at all, and inst instead using the opportunity um, to repunt a message and using the space that we um, want to to put forward. Just that. Just wanted to add that. Floor, go ahead. So my quick question is this. Last week, we had um, an impeachment that didn't go through in the US. And, and that's something that affected the narratives, similar situations, right, about a justice, right, and accountability and pushing forward reforms uh, and not delegitimizing institutions as that need to carry the work, as you all are saying. It's happened that it, something that happened in all your countries in some way or another, and many of you and your colleagues struggle with. So what, what, how do you remember those moments? I'm thinking of the, the court deciding in Slovakia that the orchestrators of, of the Kutiak murders uh, would not be found guilty, right? Or moments in, in, in Guatemala or, or, or South Africa, so. I, I wouldn't, I, Florentia, I wouldn't agree because the, the orchestrators of the murder of uh, Martin and uh, of Ma Martin and Jan of the journalists uh, are are not yet found guilty, but this is a first instance of decision. And uh, I, I believe that the court system has changed in Slovakia since the window of opportunity opened. So yes, but it is, but there is a, one thing uh, which I think is uh, interesting in the US and, and it's also everywhere. You have to decide whether you push reforms or whether you seek justice uh, and look backwards. And, uh, and, and this is an incredibly difficult question uh, to answer. Uh, what is more important? Because if you look only forward and don't take nobody into account, uh, that's, that's a problem. On the other hand, if you only selectively take on to, into account someone, that's also not really justice. So this is a this is a very difficult a difficult question to answer. We would need two more hours to speak about it. <laughs> then, Gabriel, final comment on the final on the same question. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking about it, but I I, I, don't, I don't know if if send you if you wanna. Go before me and sure. Um, I guess, yeah, I would agree uh, that this is a difficult question to answer. But I think what we found is that the institutional reform takes forever, and so some and and the politics doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Again, the point about the state is not going to self-regulate, um, even under a new administration. And so as civil society, for example, for us, our National Prosecuting Authority, um, we expected under this new administration, um, you know, with, with the heaps of evidence coming forward um, um, about those connected and implicated in state capture and corruption 
to be, um, we, we are expected to be seeing arrests and um, justice and um, at least some concrete steps taking place. But what we have seen is, is anything but that. And so I guess in, in a similar sense is to a civil society to stay organized and to understand that the state, so a robust civil society, again, is the price of our freedom. And the state is not going to self-regulate and institutional reform does not do what it's supposed to do. And a civil society, we have to remain the watchdogs and organized and vigilant um, and to keep applying pressure where pressure can, again, in these windows of opportunity, affect change. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's how, how I would say, answer that question. I, I will just add, in Slovakia, we have a lot of arrests now. The capture of state has been dismantled. So this is a great thing. And it also feels very good. <laughs> Thank you, Radovan, for closing us on a hopeful note. I, I'm going to try to wrap us up very quickly. I'm not going to try to summarize this conversation. There's a lot of rich uh, content here. I'm going to share um, you know, the, the, the profiles of our panelists again for those who are on Twitter. Otherwise, please feel free to follow them here. I think there's you know, one thing that this research, that my work in general, and this conversation in particular have highlighted is how much um, the challenges we see are similar and even interrelated, you know, as Rodan was talking about things like corporate incorporation transparency, right? These, these issues are more connected than they were ev than ever before, and we need to continue having this conversation. Um, you know, the, the one that really stuck out to me was uh, Zen at the beginning referring to the feeling of a new hope. Um, and just to me, not only do I feel that sense now, but it reminds me, I'm, I'm going to reveal my, my nerddom here, but A New Hope is the first Star Wars movie. Uh, that sense of like, there's a new possibility against the evil empire, but the second Star Wars movie, I'm not talking about the prequels, um, was The Empire Strikes Back. So in this moment, in this window, we, the window is, is an opportunity for change, but it's not a certainty. Um, and there's all these dynamics that we have to navigate. Um, and it's not a fleeting moment. Um, it does feel like a sprint, but we do have, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if it's months or years uh, to make this, to make these changes. Um, and I hope that we'll continue to learn from our colleagues um, around the world and continue to work together on this. I want to thank you all. I want to thank Zen, Radovan, Gabriel uh, for being here, Isabella uh, and, and um, uh, Netta and the Open Gov Hub for hosting us. And of course, my co-moderator, Floor. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Thank you for joining. Thank you all. And we'll share a recording after so that you don't miss anything. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.